so I'm an example of what happens when a molecular biologist gets together with computer scientists. So there'll be a little less programming in my talk and a little more biology. But I want to begin with um, a little bit of ideology. So um, first of all, I think the reason we're all here is that biology uh, really represents the technology of the future for me and I think for many of us. Um, biology knows how to make a lot of really cool things and I think we can think of carbon as the silicon of this century. That said, um, I think there's still room for a lot of basic research. Uh, biology may know how to make a lot of cool things like silk, for example. I'll talk a little bit about this, which is involved in carbon fixation, whole organisms. Um, and we still don't know how to do this. Uh, uh, so that's one of the challenges of both basic research and synthetic biology. Now this is uh, from a review that Christina Schmolke and I wrote um, that I just want to, I want to make a few points here. Ron mentioned parts, which is one of the um, underlying uh, principles around synthetic biology that, that the dream that we will be able to take bio parts from biology and assemble them, much as Ron presented, in logical and predictable ways. Now, it's, we still have a limited parts list, but that list continues to grow through systems biology or in genomics as new organisms are sequenced. That said, as you all know, you can still take a given organism and you don't know what many of the genes are doing. Um, Ron talked about robust designs. This is one of our challenges. Um, and another challenge is this issue of orthogonality. So is it really necessary for a system to operate in a cell independent of the cellular environment, or is it more important for it to engage the cellular environment? I, the pr examples I'm going to show you are ones where we actually engage the system that we build with the cellular environment. But there are many in the field that would like to see an, a system where you have an organism that is essentially acting as a chassis. It's, it's providing energy, um, but it's essentially inert in the system, and then you can layer the system on top of that. So those are sort of two extreme ways to think about synthetic biology, at least in my mind. So here's what I'm going to talk about, a little bit about what I call cell-based computing. I'm going to talk about using cellular organization in synthetic biology, and then some practical applications of design uh, with, uh, to interface with the environment. So um, this is a simple slide, I realize, but you think of DNA as the information storage uh, unit in biology. Um, and if you make an analogy to computers, you have information storage, you have compartments, and you have the chemical machinery. And even in bacteria, there are compartments. They're not just bags of enzymes, and I'll show you an example of that. Now we can program, we can edit the code, which is the DNA, and then have the RNA and proteins produce the functions. Now we can also edit the code of RNA, which um, is something that I won't be talking about, but, but Ron gave a nice example with the microRNAs. Now um, originally in trying to build cells that could, quote, compute, um, we envisioned building a cell that could remember that it had been exposed to a signal, count forward by a certain amount, and then do something. So that's our long-term goal. I'm going to show you our success at building memory into cells using a very simple biological principle. So the basic idea is that cells are exposed to a signal, they turn color, uh, you remove the signal, they remain colored as indica indicating that they've been exposed to the signal and that they remember. We built a very simple system, a positive autofeedback loop out of totally synthetic DNA parts. We did this first in yeast, um, where we have a, um, when cells are exposed to A, they turn on a transcription factor that has a DNA binding domain targeted to the nucleus. It's a transcriptional activator. It turns on what we call the memory loop through a cognate DNA binding domain, uh, and this protein is capable of activating itself. So this is a very simple system, and it worked quite well. This is in yeast. I'll just play a movie here. These cells have been activated so that what we call the trigger is on. It's red. It will disappear with time as the cells grow. 
but the cell that cells remember that they were exposed to the signal is indicated by the fact that they remain green over many cell divisions. And in fact, this particular system was quite, um, quite robust and will go on for many, many cell generations, the cells indicating that they remembered. Now, moving uh, from that what we call a toy system, which we were, by the way, able to build nice predictive systems around, predict how it would behave, fix it when it was broken. So it met all the criteria that I think Ron laid out for what we would like from a synthetic system. But we also wanted to use it to interrogate the environment within cells, eventually with the idea that perhaps we could do things like build devices that would do things in the cells. So we chose DNA damage. So we wanted to build something that would remember whether cells had been exposed to DNA damage. This, of course, is an important concept in cancer therapy, as well as the initiation of cancer. So this was pretty simple to do because our system was totally modular, and we could just drop in a promoter. This is in the case of yeast, where um, we could drop in a promoter that was a DNA damage sensitive promoter. So we just swapped the promoters, took the same circuit. This is a diagram. In the absence of DNA damaging agent, there's no signal. When you damage the cells, the trigger comes on, the memory loop comes on. When you remove the damaging agent, the trigger goes away, but the cells remember that they were exposed to DNA damage. Now, the results here were a little surprising. So first of all, it worked. So here's the trigger. It goes off and cells remember. However, in this case, unlike the simpler case I showed you previously, not all the cells remembered that they were exposed to DNA damage. And there are a lot of reasons you can think of um, about why this could be, and we can discuss those later. But what we did was to sort out the population that remembered that they were exposed to DNA damage. So the situation is you have stimulus, and then you have a subset of cells that remember. And then we sort those out. And we found that they have specific properties. So then we did all the systems biology things on them. We profiled them. We, we um, you know, looked at their, their mutation rate. And we found that it was down, but that genes involved in iron uptake and respiration were upregulated. And I'm using this as an example of what you can do with a synthetic system in cells to, to isolate cells in a certain state. Now, just a little bit of biology, what does this mean? This suggested that there was a role for the mitochondria in the DNA damage response. And to put that story together, it turns out that um, the iron sulfur clusters that are important for the DNA damage enzymes are formed in the mitochondria. And that is probably why these iron regulation genes are upregulated. And now we're in the process of studying the, the metabolism of these cells and actually sequencing the mitochondrial genomes to see what's special about these cells. So what did we learn here? We learned that we could use a synthetic device to isolate distinct populations. Um, we can trap these populations over time. We learned something about the DNA damage response, which wasn't known before. And this has implications potentially for therapy. But before we do that, we would like to move the system into mammalian cells. And what we've found is that we can actually take many of our parts and rebuild the system in a very similar way in mammalian cells. And in this case, we have, um, we have the trigger, which will respond via P53 to DNA damage. It can respond to hypoxia, which is also important within tumors. So there's a, we don't know what happens. We know that tumor cells are hy exposed to hypoxia, but we don't know what, what the whole population within a tumor looks like. Um, so we can build this system, and it works. So with no exposure, there's no expression, we can turn on the trigger, we can turn on the memory loop, and in the same way, we can sort the memory cells, and they will remember that they were exposed to the signal for many generations. So, so this system can be transferred to cancer cells, to other types of mammalian cells. So to summarize this part of the talk, um, we've built a number of parts. We tend to focus on transcription, but uh, we've also built parts around uh, protein degradation, protein splice or RNA splicing, 
Um, so we, we use the fact that we know a lot about biology to build these parts, and then we can assemble them into modules and then ultimately into devices. So I showed you examples of triggers, memory loops, and we're working on the cell division counter still getting there. Okay, so let me cut to the next second part of the talk. The, the title was both health and sustainability, and um, my view is that we, could, we can spend all the time we want making drugs and curing cancer, but if the earth isn't such a healthy place to live, then that isn't going to be, we're sort of in a race here, make a better earth, make a better health system. Um, so a planet is a terrible thing to waste. Um, so so um, one of the major resources on the planet that we actually underuse is light. Um, and of course, sunlight leads to um, the formation of carbon bonds, which is essential for life on Earth. Now, there are lots of ways to harvest sunlight. Um, I'm going to focus on the bacterial approach, which is the microalgae. There are back photosynthetic bacteria that populate the ocean. Um, they can live in brackish water. They have become um, one of the favorite tools for, for bioengineering um, for different uh, production systems. I don't want to count plants out. Um, and interestingly, I think plants have been sort of ignored by synthetic biology. And so we're pretty excited that we had an iGEM team last year that worked on plants, which has now led to a plant project in our laboratory. Um, and we also noticed that there is now being more interest in um, government funding for plants. It was sort of. Um, uh, it, there was a low level or low interest in plants for many years in this country, and I hope that grows. But in the meantime, let me tell you about these bacteria. Well, first, let me tell you about sun. Um, so, so here's how much solar power hits the Earth. Um, we only use a small fraction of that. Now, why is that? Um, well, one reason is that there's no obvious way to do it cheaply, although, of course, there are many efforts towards this, which is a good thing. Um, and then in terms of biology, there's still a problem about land usage and water. And these are areas where I think synthetic biology can have, an, have um, a big impact. So we would like to envision a cell that could use light and fix carbon. It could also use other forms of uh, energy, which I'll show you as well, to make lots of different things, not just fuels. Fuels are ob obviously popular, but um, we're also interested in making food, um, other kinds of fatty acids, vitamins. Essentially, anything that's petroleum-based, biology can probably make and do it as well as an organic chemist. We just need to figure out how to do it in a fast, effective way. And I think that's one of the major goals of synthetic biology. So here's, here's another principle that biology uses that we have also taken advantage of. So here's the good old metabolic pathway uh, that biology students used to have to learn. I don't think they have to do it anymore. Um, but they should go back and learn it because <laughs> it's going to get really important. Um, but one strategy that the cell uses is to compartmentalize these metabolic reactions. The mitochondria is, is an exquisite example of that. It packages the energy reactions for the cell. Um, the chloroplast is another example. Now let me tell you about the compartmentalization of carbon fixation in bacteria. So here's one of these uh, cyanobacteria. You'll notice that it has multiple layers of membranes and these dark objects within the cytoplasm. Um, if you know any plant biology, this should look a little bit like a chloroplast to you. And in fact, these cells are probably related to the precursors of the, pl of the chloroplast that were engulfed by cells billions of years ago when they became plants. But let's focus on this, this little unit here, which is essentially looks like a virus. It's a protein capsid. Um, and here is an example, what it, it's called the carboxysome, and it is the site of carbon fixation. So an experiment we did several years ago was to label the carboxysomes by tagging them with the green fluorescent protein. And uh, let's see, 
Here's a close-up of those cells. So the red is the natural fluorescence from the photosynthetic machinery. The green is the fluorescence from the carboxysome. This is the first example of visualizing these structural units within the cytoplasm of E. coli. So first of all, this tells you, or sorry, of cyanobacteria, but first of all, this tells you bacteria are not just bags of enzymes. They just, they do use organizational principles for metabolism. So here's the carboxysome. It houses Rubisco, um, which is the most abundant and the most inefficient enzyme on Earth, uh, probably because it evolved when CO2 was high. It's oxygen sensitive. So this may be a strategy that the cell uses to, to help protect it from oxygen. That's just a hypothesis. Um, so it's a large complex. And the other thing that we did was to build a system where we could watch them move in cells as the cells grow. And so these cells are sensitive to light, so we had to make a system that uh, regulated the light-dark cycle of the cells, and you can see them growing. And what you can see is the carboxysome segregating um, in the cells. And why this is important from a synthetic biology point of view is that they, they segregate in a conservative manner. So every time the cell divides, it gets a carboxysome. Um, and that's important if you want to engineer the carboxysome to do other things. You want to make sure that the daughter cell gets it every time. And it is necessary for carbon fixation. You can isolate in, we have tricks where we can isolate cells that have few and cells that have a lot, and the cells that have more have increased carbon fixation. Okay, so where does the synthetic biology come in? So we're interested in being able to transfer the ability to fix carbon from one cell type to another. In particular, we are interested in engineering cells that don't normally fix carbon to fix carbon or to make carbon fixation better in cells that normally fix carbon. So what we did was to take an operon that encodes the carboxysome and express it in E. coli, which don't make carboxysomes and don't fix carbon. And in fact, we got them to form in E. coli. You can see here in this EM. And the E. coli will fix carbon. So this is a first step forward and using compartmentalization as a module to move a biological function from one organism to another. Which brings me to electrofuels. And I just want to mention this because this is another strategy to indirectly use sunlight. Um, and this is a program that is paid for by the Department of Energy under the ARPA-E program. And the basic idea is to use electricity in any form. It could be coming from a solar panel. It could be coming from a windmill. To trans and transfer that electricity to an electrophilic bacterium uh, that would also have to fix CO2. And then because it's the Department of Energy, it has to produce a, uh, energy, a, a compatible fuel. So in our lab, we call this eco, electron uptake, carbon fixation, and we chose octanol as our fuel. Um, but actually, we would like the output here to be anything. So, so the advantage, one advantage of this system, if it were to work, is that unlike cyanobacteria, which are going to have to grow exposed to light, these guys could be actually living underground, and you could be piping the electricity into them. So that, that's an interesting advantage. It also takes advantage of organisms that we don't normally work with. So one of the goals of the ARPA-E program was to reach out to organisms that um, are often called extremophiles that people don't normally think about when they're doing synthetic biology. So I think that was another sort of visionary aspect of this program. So we hope to interface the bacteria with, with um, electricity, and then it has to fix carbon and make a fuel. And I want to just mention something about carbon fixation. So, so we presumably all know and love the Kelvin cycle, but it turns out from systems biology and sequencing all these new genomes of, of microbes that there are now upwards of six different ways for cells to fix carbon. And one that we really like is this three-hot pathway, which came from a, an unusual bacteria in a hot spring. Um, it has 12 different uh, steps in the pathway, but there you can take advantage of interfacing with some of the steps that already exist in the particular organism you're going to engineer it into. 
Um, the advantage of this pathway is that it's oxygen insensitive. And the point I want to make is that there, I think that going forward, as we understand nature more, there will probably be upwards of 50 different ways for cells to fix carbon. And you could imagine layering those on top of each other in a cell and making it more efficient. How do we interface with electrodes? Um, we could have hydrogen as a carrier. Other kinds of mediators, we've made protein-based mediators. You could have direct contact or molecular nanowires. All right, so let me end then um, with a little bit of a story about using compartmentalization and also about um, using sunlight. So we began our interest in, um, in biofuels by working on hydrogen because we thought you know, maybe there'd be a hydrogen-based economy. It doesn't look like that's going to happen for 25 years or so. But hydrogen is a high-energy fuel. It's clean burning, so don't discount it. And biology is capable of producing it. There are enzymes called hydrogenases. They get their electrons from uh, proteins called ferrodoxins. We can take the hydrogenases and ferrodoxins and combine them in E. coli. Um, and they will produce some hydrogen, not very well. And so we went through a series of, of experiments that I think illustrate uh, what you think about as a synthetic biologist. So one was to insulate the reaction by removing reactions that would suck away electrons, because this is an electron transfer reaction between the ferrodoxin and the hydrogenase. And it got a little better. Then we made the binding better between the ferrodoxin and the hydrogenase, a little bit better. We used something called a protein scaffold, which was, um, which was innovated by John Duber, where you can organize proteins along a scaffold by, and make specific binding sites on that protein. And it got a little bit better. And then we did something that we're good at, which is directly fusing the proteins together by making a gene fusion that has a small linker in it. And in this story, it was the best. Still only about five-fold, not so great. So then um, we turned to um, a different kind of technology, which is based around this idea of DNA nanotechnology, which I'm not going to go into, basically. Hopefully, if you're not, you are familiar with it, it's ways of constructing structures programmed out of DNA, taking advantage of the base-base interactions in DNA. You can make all these nice shapes. Um, the problem with this is that it's hard to think about how to put these, get these structures to form within cells. However, RNA is also a nucleic acid, so what we and it's something we know a lot about. So we decided to use to program RNA using the principles of DNA nanotechnology. And the basic idea is to form an RNA scaffold where via uh, RNA binding proteins and their cognate aptamer binding sites, they would be fused to another protein, which would organize them along an RNA scaffold. So that's the basic idea. To form the scaffolds, we use short pieces of RNA. Um, this is referred to as RNA tectonics. It takes advantage, advantage of sequence symmetry and the fact that you have metastable intermediates so you can get these structures to form within cells. So we form two kinds of scaffolds. One is one we call one-dimensional, and you can see this here in the uh, electron microscopy, and the other is what we call two-dimensional. It's thicker here. Um, you can see these within cells with gold particle labeling. So here's, this is in E. coli, by the way, and this is one-dimensional, the one-dimensional fibers, and these are the two-dimensional structures which seem to form these sort of platforms within the cell. So the big news in, with regard to this experiment, there were many controls to show that it really works and it brings the proteins together, but the big news was that we um, then organize the hydrogenase and the ferrodoxin along the scaffold. And in the case of the two-dimensional scaffold, we got upwards of 50-fold increase in hydrogen production. So now this is getting serious. Um, this is where you start to worry about, am I going to blow the lab up? No, not really. But um, <laughs> um, my chairman worries about that because he's labs above me. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so the point is we can organize 
these kinds of reactions along. We can form the scaffolds. We can get them to organize reactions. So we'll see if this can become a generalized principle in synthetic biology. So I want to end with, again, going back to using sunlight. So we have these organisms. They use sun. They fix carbon. They can live in brackish water. Um, can we get them to make stuff? And there's a huge interest in having them make biofuels. But we are interested in um, a different strategy, um, in part. In, as many of you know, with fuel, the markup, especially in this country, is very low. So you have to make a ton of it. On the other hand, there are things called high-value commodities where you don't have to make as much if you're a company and you can still make a profit. And we turn to sugar because depending on the day of the week, that's a high-value commodity. So the first experiment was to take the fact that the bacteria can make sucrose. We can introduce an enzyme that will cleave the sucrose into fructose and glucose. I'm oh, sorry. And they, these are autotrophs, so they don't interact with their environment. So we need to introduce transporters into their membranes so they will get the sugar out. This works. Here's a little synthetic environment where the red are the cyanobacteria, the big green glob are E. coli. The E. coli need glucose to grow, and the only source of glucose here is coming from the cyanobacteria. So in essence, we've made a little synthetic system that is where the E. coli's growth is dependent on light. So let me end with what I found. What I find is just, it's really kind of an astonishing result. Um, so we also introduced the su a sucrose transporter into these cells, because remember, they will produce sucrose as well. Now, sucrose is really a high-value commodity. And what we found was that by weight, they actually beat out sugarcane in terms of exporting sucrose. So this has, if, if this holds true and can be used in a generalizable way, holds a lot of power for many aspects of the, of the industry in terms of providing sucrose in place of sugar cane. So stay tuned on that one. Um, and let me just summarize by saying I showed you um, how we can organize intracellular pathways, interface with the environment in terms of electrodes and light. And I didn't tell you about magnets. Um, and here's my people in my lab. Thank you. Right, so why is the RNA scaffold better than the protein scaffold? So the protein scaffold um, has essentially only a f two or three binding sites per molecule, per scaffolding molecule, and it's also limited in how, m how much protein you can make in the cell. Um, whereas the RNA scaffolds are much bigger they're organizing many more proteins on so it. So it may just be a protein density thing. There's another interesting observation in that the presence of the scaffold actually um, stabilizes the proteins as well. So we may be win getting an advantage out of that as well. Yeah. Because this stays on over time? Yes, yes, yes. Also, there's another, there's actually an interesting um, industrial component to this. So a lot of the, in, if, you, if you're thinking about um, inducers in an industrial setting, oftentimes the inducer is very expensive. So this would give you a way to pulse your system and then keep it on over time. Yeah, there's this kind of system exists in nature as well. It, it's interesting because obviously you have a negative feed, negative and positive feedback are the, the main things that nature uses. And um, 
I've often, I, I always ask this question, and maybe you know the answer, is do bacteria favor one over the other? I think the bacteria have more Neg regulation and the um, carriers have more positive regulation. That's what I, I thought that too, but then I asked, someone told me I was wrong. <laughs> anyway, whatever. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, good question. So have we created the memory loops in bacterial cells? Funny you should ask that. Um, we just we just got a, a large grant to do just that. Um, so we haven't done it yet. Um, but the, the goal of the grant is to do exactly that. Um, and for example, we want to build bacteria that can report on the environment within the gut, for example. Also, to build bacteria that can record their, the history. So have they been exposed to an antibiotic? Have they ever been worked on in a laboratory? And so these are the kinds of things that we're actually going to build a very similar system in bacteria to do. We're going to use lambda proteins because we understand them really well. We actually think it's going to be easier. <laughs> So it depends on the system. Um, in the first case um, that was published a couple of years ago, um, I can't, we never see it go away. Um, it's, you know, we probably just haven't grown the cells for long enough to know. Um, there's a small percentage start to lose it over time. Um, in the case of the damaged cells, it's the same story. The damaged cells that remember, remember for a long time. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's fairly robust in that sense. In the mammalian cells, we haven't taken it out. I, okay, so the mammalian cell works pretty new, and to be honest, um, it looks like there um, it's not as robust that cells lose the memory maybe more rapidly. And I'm wondering if there, I'm thinking there might be some epigenetic effect to that, which I'm, which could turn out to be interesting, but it's something we're going to have to think about. And I have some ideas about how to address that. Yeah. Our, our memory, by the way, we actually use a, a different mechanism. We have cross-repression, and actually epigenetics in that case helped because we had a repression domain mm -hmm. that used epigenetics, and it ended up being very stable. Pretty, we tested it for, I think, three or four weeks, and it was still stable, and then I think the graduate students got bored with it. <laughs> What happens is with this repression domain, it's actually so strong that it remains there. You to then uh, de-repress it takes four days. So you have to be actually very persistent so, to try to de-repress. So just to, as a comment on that, we published a paper that takes advantage of epigenetics to convert it from repression to activation. So you can take <laughs> a protein that normally recognizes histones that act as epigenetic repressors and convert that into an activator. So then you can turn on selective genes that are silenced through epigenetics. And a lot of those turn out to be important in cancer or reverting cancer. So you can use that too, Ron. <laughs> okay. 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 Let's thank Terry.